Andrew's going to be posting a link to an Excel sheet that has all the PI tutor time availability and what classes they're available for. Um, I'm available for uh, to help out with all the chem series, um, beginning physics, 210, 250, uh, some bio courses. Um, but what PI leaders are, students who have taken the class who did well. Um, so we understand the material and our goal is to help you as much as possible, at least in um, directing your thinking in the right way, especially because if you're looking for online information and um, sometimes when you do that, things aren't really clear. Um, we may not know all the answers all the time, um, but we, we try to help you at that least. That goes for me too, Zach. <laughs> yeah, we at least try to guide you um, in the right direction and give you available resources. Um, so the temp, uh, STEM Center uh, tutoring has moved online to a Discord uh, server. Um, and there's, there's a lot more uh, other tutors that help across subjects. So if I'm not, you know, if you're looking for help and I'm not necessarily available because you come when my hour, you know, outside my hours, there's usually another chem, hopefully another chem tutor um, that can help out in the moment. Or if you just leave, you know, a question on the server, someone will try to get to it when they are available. Um, uh, there is a BCS cohort, I believe, in this class. Um, I have uh, specific hours for on Thursdays between three to four. Um, that's pretty much the gist of it. If you have any questions about any of that, feel free to reach out to me, hop on the Discord server, look around, um, yeah, use the, use the resources. We are expecting there to be a bit more of an influx of students using our resources than we've had previously since they are easier to access before. Um, previously when, uh, before things transitioned online, uh, we were only available in the STEM center. So you actually had to come to us during our times to get help. Um, but it, you know, that's cool. More students have access to help you guys do better in these classes, which are really important in succeeding towards your majors. Um, but with that being said, we, uh, during those uh, tutoring hours, if there are a lot of students, we also uh, do recommend helping each other if you know, you know something and maybe I'm overwhelmed and there's not another chem tutor around, um, really use those as just like communal spaces to help each other uh, because explaining something to another student can also help solidify your understanding of that material. And if you know one of us catch you explaining something incorrectly, we can help hop in and try to direct that in the right direction. Yeah, that, that's something really profound you said there, Zach. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I have found that just you know in the last three years uh, teaching this class, I have taught myself more about chemistry than I have thought about in a really long time. Um, by explaining to somebody else um, uh, how something works, you basically teach yourself how to understand it a lot better. I mean, because a lot of this stuff, I haven't thought about it in like 30 years. I've been a, I've been a practicing um, research scientist for like a really long time, um, mostly in, in, in biochemistry and, and, and pathology. And so all of this basic stuff I hadn't really thought about in a really long time. I just sort of took it for granted. But now that when you have to, you know, actually explain it to somebody, um, I found that I understand it a lot more than I did before because I sort of just, you know, I'd, I'd take a test, I'd learn it in my head, I'd write it down and then I'd forget about it. But when you have to actually explain it to someone, you need to understand it um, before you can explain it. And so, yeah, that's a really good point. If you can explain it to somebody, um, you're doing both people a favor, both yourself and, and the person you're explaining it to. So yeah, uh, thanks, one follow up before so. I head out and leave you guys with your class. Um, I got a quick message uh, asking about this, but it's in regard to the BCS cohort that has the mandatory uh, meetings on three to four. Um, I was told you guys aren't meeting today uh, and to expect to come to that session next Thursday. So just putting that out there. Um, all right, nice meeting you guys. Um, and hopefully I'll see you or hear from you guys in uh, my available tutoring hours. All right, thanks, thanks Zach. Yeah, if anybody has any questions uh, for Zach, his email address and um, is, is, is posted and um, 
yeah, like I said, I'm, I'm going to be posting the schedule, the tutoring schedule in Canvas right after the class. So you'll be able to get in touch with them that way, obviously. All right. I'll talk to you later. Um, one thing I want to mention before um, we get started was that um, there's going to be two different lab sections. Um, I'll have a lab section that I'll be uh, leading, um, I'll obviously meeting on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, the recitations will be on uh, Thursday and the labs will be on Tuesday. Um, my lab section will be completely virtual. So it'll be all online. Uh, we'll be meeting online. We'll be doing our, our um, experiments online. It sounds kind of weird, but it actually is kind of fun um, doing these sort of uh, virtual labs. Um, and you know, collecting our data online and doing everything else. The other lab section um, with Dr. Bates, AJ Bates, his lab is basically gonna be sort of like a hybrid, um, whereas you will have to physically go to the campus and pick up um, a kit of uh, stuff to do um, your experiments at your home. And you'll be doing these uh, together with, with, with Dr. Bates. I've already received um, a message from someone in, um, who's out of the country who obviously can't come to Skyline and pick up uh, a kit to do things at home because you know they're thousands of miles away. If that is the case, um, send me a message and I will do my best to just switch you from one section um, to the other. And if you find out that um, you're in my section and you can, and would prefer to do um, the labs like physically hands-on lab because I, I learn hands-on myself. If I can build something, if I can model something with my own hands and look at it, I, I, I tend to learn a lot better. If you're one of those uh, people and you wanna switch sections, um, let me know. If, if, if you're local and, and you can do that and you'd, you'd, you'd rather do that, we can switch you from the, from the totally virtual lab section to the you know hands-on virtual lab section, okay? So yeah, just send me an email or you can go to Canvas and uh, send, send me a message there. Either way, you know, I, I, I respond to, to questions pretty quickly, all right? So any, any questions about all that stuff uh, before we get started? Um, one quick question. Yeah. Are, uh, are, um, are Bates's um, labs at a different time than yours, or are they going to be at the same time? The same time of the day, but different days. I think his are on Thursdays and mine are on Tuesdays. Got it, thank you. Yeah, so, but he won't be having a lab this afternoon because you know, obviously it's the very first day. No one's gone to pick up their kits and, and, and everything else. But, so he'll be explaining exactly what's gonna happen this afternoon and doing the same recitation that our group is gonna do and then he'll start on Tuesday. Okay, but yeah, great, great question. So. How do you know what group we're in? Oh, go ahead. How do you know which group we're in? Um, go to Canvas, if you're in group AD, that's Dr. Bates's section. And so the labs are only, I thought the labs were meeting both Tuesday and Thursday, but are they only meeting either Tuesday or Thursday? We're meeting both Tuesday and Thursday, but okay. one of the days is the recitation or the problem solving um, session, and the other day is the lab. So for okay. my session, uh, um, Thursdays are the, are the recitation days and Tuesdays are the lab. So we'll be, we'll be doing our first uh, virtual lab on Tuesday. And then Dr. Bates, um, you'll have recitation on Tuesday and labs on Thursday. Got it. So uh, group A or D, right? A D is 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 Bates. That's the yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh that's uh Thursday, right? Yes. Okay. The lab itself is on is on Thursdays, right. And he'll okay. so so this afternoon he'll explain how how to get that started. And then I think your first lab will be next week. Okay. Yeah. Oh, oh. one other thing. If I I need someone to be a chat monster. Um 
I'm not, I won't be able to watch the chat and um, answer questions at the same time. So if someone uh, wants to let me know what's going on in, in the chat, if someone has a question that I can't, I can't see both simultaneously. So if, uh, if someone wants to, to, to volunteer to be the, the, the chat monster and, and keep me updated, that, that would be great. So anyone out there? Okay. So let's get started. Um, so as you can see, I've got sort of like a lab here. <laughs> this is what our poor labs are gonna look like since no one's gonna be there taking care of them. Um, hopefully um, there's a few classes at Skyline um, that are going to attempt to do some, some labs this term, um, you know, keeping six feet apart with masks on and, and, and everything else. I hope to get back to some sort of normalcy um, sometime soon. But um, what you're going to be learning in this particular um, class is we're going to look at, at, at matter, basically. Um, if you looked at my, if, if, if you looked at my um, intro video, you saw that why chemistry is the most important science. I mean, you should have known that anyway. But chemistry is the most important science because it's the, it's the science of matter. And since that's everything, we're the science of everything. So we're going to try to explain how changes in the composition and structure of matter are involved with actual chemistry. And one thing you're going to learn is that really chemistry should just be called electronics, really because everything to do with chemistry is basically to do with electrons. And so um, you'll find that pretty much everything we talk about is going to be electron based. Um, all, all the chemical reactions are electron based. Um, pretty much everything you deal with, ooh, I can hear myself, um, is dealing with electrons. So we're going to classify these, these changes in matter. We're going to understand, hopefully, um, how they occur. And one of the things we're going to get to a little, a little bit later on yeah, that's really important in, in chemistry is talking about the changes in energy. Um, we're going to study, get ready, thermodynamics. Ah, sounds scary. But really, thermo just means heat, and dynamics just means change. So we're just going to be talking about changes in heat. And so that's a really, really important part of chemistry because it ex basically explains why some reactions happen and some reactions don't, why some reactions are fast and some reactions are slow, all involving um, changes in, in energy. Now, I personally um, am a biochemist. And so um, I'm going to try and relate a lot of the things um, that we look at in everyday life um, including changes that happen uh, inside your body, reactions that take place in your body. I'm going to try and relate what we're learning to that, just to show you that um, pretty much everything you do, everything you see, everything you feel is chemistry um, because they're all chemical reactions. Digesting food, right now you're taking the, the breakfast that you had this morning, hopefully you had time for breakfast this morning, you are physically burning that inside your body. That sounds like, well, I'm burning it. Yes, you are burning it. And you're going to learn um, from this class that the amount of energy you get from, from that food would be exactly the same as if you lit it on fire. Um, and you're going to understand why, that's, why that takes place. Because we can take really simple reaction and we can break it into like an infinite number of steps like happens inside your body. And when you add all those steps up, you're going to get the same thing as, as the original um, setting fire uh, reaction. Um, that's something we're going to, we're, we're going to learn um, this term. Um, refining crude oil, uh, synthesizing polymers. I'm going to talk a little bit about organic because um, a lot of biochemistry is, is, is organic chemistry. Don't freak out that it's going to be an organic chemistry class because it isn't. But um, I sort of want to give you a good, good introduction because a lot of you are going to be taking organic, hopefully, um, later because you're all going to become successful biochemists 
of course, right? And you need to take organic first. So I'm going to sort of, you know, give you slow, slow hand-holding introduction in, into organic as well, because I find organic chemistry to be a lot more fun than inorganic chemistry, but don't tell anybody I said that. Um, so <clears throat> another thing I really like about, about chemistry is the, is, is, is the historical uh, context of it. I'm going to try and introduce um, some of the people who are responsible um, for our, our, our understandings in chemistry, because a lot of them are really interesting people. Um, a, and a lot of them are desperately weird. You will find that a lot of, a lot of um, chemists and scientists are pretty strange because, I mean, let's face it, it takes a kind of a strange person to think to themselves, I'm so damn smart that I'm going to study something and I'm going to publish things and I'm going to make the world understand chemistry a lot better than, than they understand it now. And so you'll find that a lot of us are a little strange in the head. Um, and I think, I think that's kind of important to me because like who else is going to think to themselves that, you know, I'm going to be able to push forward the boundaries of, 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 of science. Um, of course, all of you are going to do the same thing. So attempts to understand how chemistry works goes way, way back. And you're probably familiar uh, with the sort of the four basic, you know, not the four basic food groups, but the four basic elements of matter that the Greeks thought about, earth, air, fire, and water. And they saw how, you know, you would combine two and get something else. You take three, combine them and, and get something else. And then later on, I mean, and the Greeks actually came up with the idea of the atom. Um, the atom was something um, that could not be divided. And as we know, I mean, that's not quite the case. I mean, you can split atoms uh, apart. You can take them apart. But the atom itself is the smallest. It still remains the smallest um, uh, indivisible part of a chemical element. So they were right about that. And you're probably familiar with the, the idea of, of, of alchemy. Um, how for like hundreds and hundreds of years, people would pay alchemists, they were part of the royal court in a lot of different places, to try and take base metals like lead and turn them into gold. Um, the thing is, we can actually do that now. Um, with a, a nuclear accelerator, you can actually take an element and turn it into another element. In fact, that's how all new um, elements, whenever you hear about a new element being discovered, it wasn't actually discovered, it was made in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a collider where you took one element and you smash another element into it and some tiny amount of it actually stays together for like a fraction of a second and that's a new element. So we can do that, um, it's just not particularly a good way to, to, to make gold. Oh, let me go back for a second. <clears throat> so again, just to, to beat this, um, uh, concept to death. Any other science you want to get into, you really need uh, uh, sort of an understanding of, of chemistry because I mean, anywhere else you want to go, if you want to be, if you want to go to Davis and study agriculture, you need to know chemistry. If you're going to take any kind of medicine, obviously that's essential that you know how, um, you know, chemistry, because, you know, you, you need to know how drugs work. You need to know how to measure things. You need to know about dosing, all that stuff uh, we're going to learn about. Um, mathematics is going to be really important. I should have probably mentioned that at, at, at the beginning. Um, you're really going to need to sharpen your algebra skills <laughs> in order to take, because we're going to be doing a lot of algebra. Um, if I said it was um, chemistry is about um, might as well be called electronics. It might as well be called chemical algebra too, because you're going to find that a lot of the stuff we're going to learn about has been broken down into laws and laws are basically uh, an understanding of, a, of, of an equation, how we understand how one thing changes another thing. And if you can do algebra, if you can move things around, you can solve for X, um, you're not going to have a very hard time. Uh, doing the math. If it's been a long time since you've done algebra, you might want to brush up a little bit and I'll try and help as much as I can because I, I have to say I've, I've brushed up on my algebra a ton since I haven't had to do any for, for, uh, for quite a while. So um, 
this is more of like a physics thing, but we are going to be um, dealing with uh, forces and energy uh, as well. And so there's basically two kinds of, uh, of, of energy, kinetic energy and potential. Um, so kinetic energy, sort of, I think we sort of have a basic understanding what that means. Um, kinetic just means moving, right? If, some, if we think of something as being kinetic, we think that it, it moves, it's fast. Um, now that movie was really kinetic. It means that like, you know, a lot of things were happening, a lot of things were, were, were moving. Um, we're gonna talk about waves a lot later on. It's one of my, also, I keep talking about like, you know, how much of the class is my favorite. We talk about waves when, when, when we get into um, quantum mechanics. And yes, we're going to understand quantum mechanics when we, when we were all done. How light is both a wave and a particle. And that is going to lead to an understanding of, again, electrons, since everything comes back to electrons, how well, electrons work. Give us all the Let's go. We'll make 2021 better than 2020. Ooh, someone's listening Great. to the news. And so potential energy. It's going to, what that means is basically it's all about uh, an object's position. Um, it, it, that's a sort of easy to understand when we think about like you know, a rock at the top of a hill has a lot of potential energy. So you give it a little nudge and it, and, it, and it rolls down. That would be gravitational potential energy. Or if we pull a spring apart and then let it go and snaps back, that's physical energy that, that we're basically storing up and then letting go. But there's also energy stored in bonds. And one of the things that we're going to learn that's sort of, um, you know, make, it's difficult for some people to understand because it seems kind of weird, is that um, energy is released when bonds are made, when chemical bonds are made, not when they're broken. So, I mean, you know, I don't know about you, but I've always thought that, you know, when you set fire to some, you know, you have enough uh, bonfire at the beach or something, you're figuring when I'm breaking all those um, bonds in the wood, it's releasing all that energy. No, it's actually the formation of the bonds when you make water and carbon dioxide from burning that, that releases energy. So we're gonna learn that all that food that you ate for breakfast this morning, it takes energy to break those bonds, all those bonds that were in the food, like glucose and, and fats and uh, different things that, 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 are, that are in there, carbohydrates, all that energy in those bonds, you have to add energy to break them. But then when you exhale water vapor and carbon dioxide, that releases uh, so a lot. It kiss oh, me? Question, yeah. Uh, so it's like... Uh... You're adding energy to the system. Uh, you, uh, you are adding energy. You release the energy from the system. You release the energy. You have to add a, a small amount of energy to break those bonds, but then you get more energy back when you make new bonds. And and we'll 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 learn that is that um, basically all systems want to go to lower energy because it's more stable. So all systems want basically to, to achieve stability, want to lose energy to get to a more stable state. And so what's more stable, a very complex carbohydrate or water and carbon dioxide? Well, water and carbon dioxide are a lot more stable. So you lose energy when you go from something complex, like a large carbohydrate, sucrose or you know, um, glycogen, what, whatever, whatever it is, and you move to something simpler, you release energy. And that's the energy you get um, from food. Okay. So the last one on the bottom, nuclear energy actually isn't chemical because that happens inside the nucleus. Like when you, when you, um, when large atoms break in, in, into smaller ones, like uranium breaks into, into uh, smaller atoms and, re and, and releases a lot of energy, that actually isn't chemistry, that's physics. But we'll sort of let that go because no electrons were harmed in, in, in the making uh, of nuclear energy. Electrons didn't go from, from one element to another. 
So that's not a chemical reaction. That's actually a physical, a nuclear reaction. But it's also uh, the release of, of, of energy. So as I just mentioned, lower energy states, more stable. And so eventually, like in the universe, we keep saying that like all it will eventually have sort of some sort of heat death, you know, and all the energy will, will be released. But energy isn't created or destroyed. We're going to find out when we get into our, our thermo um, part of the, of, of, of the class. Energy just goes from one place to another. It just changes form. Like, for instance, when, when we eat food, and then I don't know about you, but whenever I have like a really big meal, I feel warm. It's like, you know, I just ate like a, a way too much steak or something like that, and my body gets really, really warm. What's happened is that that chemical energy inside uh, the bonds have been converted to thermal energy. They've just moved from one place to another. So we can't, so energy is always conserved. And when we do um, some, uh, some chemical reactions in, in our labs, and we do some physical reactions as well, we'll see that we took energy from one place and just moved it to another. And it'll be equal and opposite. And that proves that energy can't be created or destroyed because we take one as positive, one as negative, we add them together and we'll get zero. So we just convert energy from one form to another form. And we'll just be, and so what in class we'll be learning about how do we calculate um, that energy. We'll measure a particular energy for a reaction and then we'll go back and convert that into energy for a different reaction. Uh, excuse me? Yep. So uh, all these energies are, are uh, observed in a, in a micro uh, view, right? Like potential energy. When you say micro, what, what are you referring to? I'm, I'm, I'm losing you there a little bit. Uh, connect. Like we are not talking about matters, we are talking about atoms. Yeah, we're talking about atoms, definitely. But, but this is something you'll actually be able to so physically, sorry. it's sort of on a macro scale, because it's something you'll actually be able to, to measure. It's something you'll actually be able to see. Because um, one, one way we measure this energy is actually by seeing the energy of a chemical reaction move into water like we can do this is called calorimetry and we'll be doing that a little bit later um, in the class you do a reaction inside um, uh, uh, some sort of uh, holder or module inside of a inside of a, a particular flask surrounded by water and you watch the water temperature go up and so the chemical energy from the reaction is being converted into thermal energy in the water. And so we can measure the amount of energy going into the water by its change in temperature. We'll also learn that heat and temperature aren't the same thing. And so you'll, it's, 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 it's real. It's like, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a macro thing. You'll be able to actually see it happening. But yes, it's happening on a, on a, on a very, very small scale. Like these, these atoms are actually when we when we move electrons from one place to another, that's going to equal a, ch a change in energy, we'll, and we'll be able to see that and measure it. So one thing I really want to to go over because this is really really misunderstood uh, is the scientific method. So I mean, as a practicing scientist for a really long time, this is something I did every day. You know, you base knowledge on something you can observe, something you can test. So I would have a hypothesis. A hypothesis is just basically an idea. That's really all it is. So you do an experiment, you get some results, you don't really understand it. You have to come up with a hypothesis. Why did that happen? And that has to be testable. That is the key part of the whole thing. I can have so this is something that, you know, people that don't believe in science, people that don't believe in evolution, uh, anti-vaxxers, I mean, all kinds of people who don't believe in the scientific method will come to you and say, oh, that's just a hypothesis. Oh, that's just a theory. 
they don't understand what these words mean because a hypothesis needs to be something you can test. Anybody could have a, an idea. I mean, yeah, you know, I think that happens because, you know, the flying spaghetti monster made it happen. Yeah, that's an idea. It's not a hypothesis because you can't test that. So you need to be able, a hypothesis means an idea that you can actually physically test in the lab and make predictions that explain the result. So if you come up with, a, with an explanation for that result, that becomes a law. Now, some, a lot of people think, well, the law must be the highest form of, of science. It isn't. A law just um, summarizes a lot of different um, things, a lot of different observations that you see in the lab, like the law of gravity. The law of gravity has been a law for 500 years, but it didn't become a theory until three years ago. Now, the difference is, now Newton's law of gravity always works. You know, you throw something up and it comes down and, and, and Newton could, could make an equation that explained why Jupiter took this long to go around the sun. And so it was a law, it always worked. And so, but the difference was he didn't have a theory as how it worked. So he, he could explain, he could show that it, that it worked very well, but he couldn't explain why. And that's why a theory is the highest thing. And so you can't get better than a theory. So when people say, well, it's only a theory. Yeah, but a theory explains something and it's testable. So the difference with a theory of gravity was that, I don't know, if, um, I was volunteer teaching in San Francisco um, when this sort of groundbreaking um, uh, announcement came out in the news that scientists had, det had, had detected magnetic or uh, gravitational waves. I don't know if any of you remember that, but it was a big idea for geeks like me. Um, and I sort of told my class, I got all excited, you know, gravitational waves. And they were like, yeah, well, who cares? I said, you don't realize this, but a bunch of people who are about to win the Nobel Prize just mentioned something really important today. And the reason why it was so important is that they had finally discovered how gravity works because no one knew how gravity worked before. And gravity works on these tiny, tiny waves that someone had finally managed to detect like 500 years after Newton made up the, you know, discovered the law, came up with the law of, of, of gravity. So there's a big, big difference between a hypothesis, a law, and a theory. So the theory of evolution means that not only do we understand the mechanism that evolution takes, but we can make testable hypotheses on how something will happen in the future and we can test it. And so that's why uh, you can't just uh, say something's only a theory. It's like, no, dude, theory is as good as it gets. It doesn't really get any better than that because it gives us an explanation and it explains how something works. You need both of those things in order to have a theory. So a lot of the things that we're going to be talking about in, 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 in class are now theories because we know we have an explanation of how they work. Not only can we make, we can write equations and give you to like 17 decimals, you know, how well, how well they, they, they work. We can predict how well they work, but we know how now we have a mechanism and we can, we can see that mechanism at, uh, at work. So I want you to, to take that as a, as a really important take home message, because I think it's one of the most misunderstood things about science, the difference between a hypothesis, a law and a theory. Cause you know, if I ever came up with a theory, I'd be really famous. Um, I've had tons of hypotheses. <laughs> some of them have worked out and some of them haven't. That's the nature of, of, of doing experiments. Um, but the, if you come up with a theory, we name buildings and, uh, after you. So just really quickly, since I sort of blathered about this way, way too long anyway. Um, you're curious about something. You make some observations. Um, you would form an idea, like why did that happen? And so you come up with an idea and you say to yourself, 
well. I'm going to draw on this a little bit. So you have an idea here. So you're going to come up with an idea. Well, why did that happen? I say it happened because the phase of the moon. And so you would do some experiments at different phases of the moon. And if you got the, if you got a predictable result based on the phase of the moon, you say, ah, my hypothesis was correct. So I do some more experiments and I make more observations If my resistance. If my results were consistent, then, that would contribute to the body of knowledge. I'd, I'd publish a paper, I, I, you know, with my other with my other um, people that I that I worked on, and I've published plenty of those. But it wouldn't be a law, and it wouldn't be a theory at that point because I couldn't explain why the phase of the moon was so important. Other people would have to do more experiments and slightly different experiments, and show that that. It's consistent over and over and over with lots of different people. And after that, it would become a law. It would become the law of the moon. Still wouldn't be enough to be a theory because we wouldn't know how it worked. So additional testing supports that hypothesis. And then we get a mechanism. Then it becomes a theory. And whoever comes up with the theory, well, then they became famous, even though it was my idea in the first place. If I stayed along, alive long enough, they might name the, the theory after me, but usually it's, it's the person who actually proves it. So these are the different domains of chemistry that we're going to be, do, we're going to be dealing with. It so actually goes back to a, a, an earlier question of a micro and macro. Um, so just looking at water, for instance. So moisture in the air, the way we can actually see, we can actually physically detect water would be in the macro domain. Whoops, let me go back. So we can see that there's three different phases of water, three different phases of most things. Um, water vapor, that like I live in Pacifica by the coast, so it's normally, it's pretty, there's a, the humidity is fairly high. I just came back from Lake Tahoe where the humidity is very low. And you can probably tell from my voice, I'm still a little scratchy from it. Um, we can see solid water in the form of, of, of the iceberg. We can touch it. I've got some ice in my glass right here. And we can see that you know, the, most of the time it's, it's, it's liquid at what we would say standard temperature and pressure pressure being one atmosphere, standard temperature being around 25 degrees C, water is a liquid. We can also, at the molecular level, we can draw these. And that's these um, pictures right next to it. So we'll, we're gonna be looking at these as well. So in the gas phase, molecules are far apart and they don't interact very much. We're gonna learn about uh, gases in, in chapter eight. Now, in the liquid form, we do see interactions between them. And in fact, we're going to learn about very special interactions with water. I'm going to talk about water a lot because water is the single most important molecule on Earth for a lot of different reasons. So when it comes to water, I'm going to just babble my head off. Actually, the, the, the chairman of my thesis committee had a five-volume um, bound series of books, like 600 pages each, like five of these. And the title was Water. Like he was really into water. So water, water is super, super important. There wouldn't be life without it. And I'm going to explain why that is uh, a, li a little bit later. It's the very um, physical and chemical properties of water that makes life itself uh, possible. And so you can see it's really loud outside. So you can see when we have liquid, or this is, we have solid water, it interacts in a very specific way. The molecules don't move around so much, and they interact very, very closely. That's what makes it a solid, as the, the molecules themselves don't move nearly as much, and they interact very, very strongly together. And then at the bottom, we can see in a liquid form, they're further apart, but they still interact with each other. It's really important to, to see that they still, <coughs> excuse me, they still interact 
um, with each other. And it's that interaction um, between them that defines when water freezes, when water boils, and how other molecules inside water, and the, most of us is water, how all those molecules interact uh, with, with the water itself. So believe me, you're gonna get sick and tired of, of, of hearing about water. Anybody have any questions so far? I mean, I've been sort of going blathering on. I, I really want you to interrupt. I mean, that's the, sort of the whole point of having. Uh, I see some. Yeah. See some books uh, has a solution as a, 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 a as a. Solution is what? Is a solution is a mixture. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, uh, I see some uh, books has AQ as a base. Oh, AQ. Yes. So that's yeah. That, that's that's a good good question. Um, so you can see all these different phases here. We've got gas, and we've got solid, and we've got liquid. You're probably familiar with those, but the one he just mentioned was aqueous. AQ. Anyone take, what does that mean? Uh, aqueous solution. Mm -hmm. so, so what that means is that something is dissolved in water. So if I was to, if I was to say like sodium chloride, if it's table salt, if it's by itself, like sitting and just worth to sprinkle it on my food, that's a solid, right? When I pour it into water, something actual, uh, or when I eat it, a chemical reaction actually takes place. Whereas the bond between sodium chlorine is broken and I get sodium plus an ion, and we'll learn about that, and chloride ion minus. And then we would put next to them AQ to say that that is now an ion and it's dissolved in water. So yes, that, 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 that is another, that is another uh, form that we've talked about. So, uh, uh, so, uh, so uh, solution is a uh, is a phase, right? No, because uh, we talk about a a phase of a particular substance is. Oh, that's an interesting point. Um, we're talking about pure substances here. So we're talking about uh, water. We're talking about you know iron as a solid. We're talking about a chemical compound. Um, so it's either, actually there's four. Anyone know what the fourth one is? There's, there's gas, liquid, solid, and anyone know what the fourth? Is it plasma? Plasma, very good. Someone's read the slides, excellent. Yeah, plasma. Plasma just basically means it's an ion also in a gas form, like the sun is a, a, is a form of plasma or um, a neon sign that's having electricity put through it, it glows. That's also uh, a, a plasma. Ah, you get, so we get, that's an excellent introduction to the different phases. So as uh, we sort of went through how, how we describe each one. So um, solid brackets, small s, liquid brackets, small l, gas brackets, small g. Now, a solid, we sort of pretty much know this, just, you know, just thinking about it, but maybe we don't really think about exactly what, like, I know what a solid and a liquid and a gas is, but can you describe it to someone who had never heard of them? So a solid is hard, it's rigid, doesn't mean it's like, you know, a solid can be kind of mushy too, but it's a solid because it possesses a definite shape. That's really all a solid is, is something that has a shape. Now, a liquid can move and it doesn't have a shape. Um, whatever you pour a liquid into, that's its shape. So if I pour it into a vase that looks like this, that's its shape. If I pour it into a cube, that's its shape. Um, if I pour it into like a glass, that's its shape. But it has a definite volume. It doesn't change volume. It doesn't matter what I pour it into, it's gonna have the same volume. Now a gas is different in that it doesn't have a shape and it doesn't have a volume either. Now we're gonna learn about um, 
gases, like I said in, in, in chapter eight. Now a gas, the weird thing about uh, uh, gas is if I put gas in a container, it's full. It doesn't matter how much gas I put in there. It's full. Why? Because there's gas molecules in every single part of that container. So like if, you have, if you're filling, uh, if you, have, you, get, you know, I have an empty container of gas for my, for my barbecue, my, my butane uh, container. It's empty. No, it isn't. It's actually full of butane. There's just not very much in there. But if I went to any part of that um, container of, but of butane, I would find butane. It wouldn't matter what part, I would find some. Even though it says empty on it, it isn't. There's still butane in there. It's just that the pressure is now the same as the atmospheric pressure. It doesn't mean it's empty. It just means there's not very much in there. And so it doesn't have a volume because no matter how much, no matter how big my, my container of gas is, it's going to be filled. It just won't be filled to very much pressure. And we'll learn the difference between volume and pressure when it comes to gases a little bit later. So solid, fixed shape and volume. Liquid, definite volume, not a definite shape. And a gas, no shape and no uh, definite volume. What about a magma? Magma or plasma? Magma. Magma is a liquid. So if you're, if you're, if you're thinking about um, like in a volcano, mm -hmm. yeah, that would, that would be a liquid because it can flow. So lava, well, lava is magma when it's below the earth. When magma comes to the surface, it becomes lava. That would be a liquid, a really thick liquid, <laughs> I will grant you. But if it can flow, it's not a solid, it's, it's a liquid. So when it cools, it becomes a solid, but when it's hot, it's, it's a liquid. And we'll learn that the only difference between a solid and a liquid and a gas is the amount of heat uh, in, in each one. That's the, that's, that's the only difference. If we remove heat from a gas, it, because it becomes a liquid. If we remove the heat from the liquid, it becomes a solid. And because the mo molecules move slower. At what temperature do, do molecules stop moving all together? Anyone tell me that? Excuse me? At what temperature? So as we lower the temperature and remove heat, molecules start moving slower and slower. At what point do they stop moving entirely? Absolutely zero. Zero, like zero kelvins? Zero kelvin, exactly. Yeah, and that is why we're going to learn why kelvin is so important when we talk about gases. Um, basically, all the calculations we're going to do um, with gases are in kelvin for that very reason. Um, because gases involve movement of molecules. The faster they move, the more like... Uh, the more like gas they're going to be. And the only temperature where something is completely ungas like is zero because there's no movement of molecules at all. So everything is a solid um, at zero. So plasma here, that's the sort of the fourth um, state of matter that we don't really deal with um, much, but um, you know, we, we, we can see it in nature. Um, plasma, is basically just a gas with charged particles. That's all it is. Most gases, if not all, all gases, don't have ions in them, uh, charged particles, where you have positive charges and negative charges. And the reason for that is gas, for, for molecules to be in the, in, in the gaseous state, they can't interact with each other much because if they start to interact with each other, then they sort of start to slow down and they turn into a liquid or, or, or a solid. You don't want them to interact with each other. So uh, plasma has super high energy, which allows these charged particles to not stick to each other and interact with each other. So you need really high temperatures for, the, for this to occur. Yes, there's a question. So uh, a fire would be a uh, plasma? No. Because we don't see... Um, fire actually isn't a state. Fire is a chemical reaction. I mean, the, the light of fire? The light is, and 
man, we're getting all sorts of great questions very first, because <laughs> this is all stuff we're going to learn later on. The light that comes from fire is actually a change. What you're looking at is the change of energy of the electrons moving from one state to another. So what we're going to learn um, later on is that the electrons in an element, when you add energy to them, the electrons move up in energy and they go up. So we're, when we add energy to them, like let's look at neon, like neon sign. So when there's no energy going into a neon sign, there's no light. But if we put neon inside of a tube and then we shoot electricity through it, we have like a positive end and a negative end and we add, a, add electricity to it. The, the electrons in, in, in those neon atoms go up in energy. And then when they fall back, to what we call the ground state, they emit light. And they emit light at very specific wavelengths. And so a neon sign would have a different color than a helium sign or a hydrogen sign or whatever else. So we're gonna learn that that is actually a chemical um, reaction. It's not actually a, a state, okay? But yeah, mm -hmm. keep asking questions because yeah, we're gonna learn all this stuff and so, um, and, uh, you know, a lot of people are thinking, oh, I know that already, or I, you know, I like to pretend I knew that already. But this is, this is, this is stuff we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna learn as, 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 as the class goes on. Okay. So, these are just some, some more basic uh, things to uh, learn. Plasma oh, go ahead. is it's like a, a more gaseous gas. So, I, could, I couldn't hear uh, that So, one. plasma is like a... More gas, gas. So, uh, what about um, more solid? Solid that is more solid than. Yeah. Solid. So plasma, plasma is 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 in a gaseous state. Plasma is just a very high temperature, uh, very high temperature gas where you have um, ions form. You have charged particles, and so it's extremely energetic. Um, I just meant, uh, uh, w will there be uh, any uh, any phase for l a very low temperature solid? Uh, would that be also solid or? Yeah, or? basically any anything you cool down to a low enough temperature becomes a solid, even uh, helium. Um, uh, although helium is very difficult to get into the solid state. You need to get to basically zero. Kelvin to turn helium into a solid. It's extremely difficult. To, everything else becomes a solid at, at a, you know, a fairly low temperature, but nothing you need to below, really, really below a solid uh, space, right? What's that? So uh, we have solid, uh, liquid, gas, plasma, mm -hmm. and nothing goes below solid, right? Nope. Okay. I, don't, I, can't, I can't think of anything that's like more solid than solid. <laughs> yeah, it just it just refers to like the how the how the molecules hold together. Okay. Yeah. It, if it has a, if it has a shape and a volume, it's a solid, and we just sort of leave it at that. So that sort of leads us to the next next thing. Well, we only got a few minutes left, but um, the next thing we need to, to need to think about is when you're doing, actually when you're doing a lab, this will, this will happen all the time. Um, mass and weight get confused all the time. So mass is just the amount of, amount of stuff in an object, that's it. But the weight refers to the force of gravity that, on that object. So I can measure my weight, I have more trouble measuring my mass. If I have a if I have a balance or a scale that's that's very well calibrated, I can measure my mass also. But basically, I'm just I'm just measuring my weight. And the difference is, you're probably well aware that on the moon, your weight is one sixth of what it is on Earth. Why? Just because of the gravity. But what about your mass? Is, would that be the same or not be the same? Should be the same, I believe. Yeah, it is the same. And so a lot of people have trouble thinking about this. I mean, um, if you're in space and someone takes out a gun and shoots you, that bullet is weightless. 
Is that going to be a threat to you? Is that bullet just going to bounce off you because it's weightless? I don't think so. No, <laughs> no, it is not because it's not massless. It still has the same amount of mass that it has on earth. It doesn't weigh anything, but it still has the same amount of mass and it's still going to go through you and kill you. So that's why when you see astronauts, you know, moving these like incredibly heavy things because the, they're weightless, they have to be super careful because, you know, if you're up in the, well, there's no space shuttle anymore, but if you're, if you're like on the international space station or something and someone has this like huge object that they sort of get moving towards you, you got to be careful because that is like, it may be like, you know, a 500 kilogram object coming towards you and it may only weigh a couple of ounces, but it has a mass of <laughs> quite a lot. And so, you know, if you don't see it coming, it's going to be bad news for you. So mass and weight are not the same thing. And so we're, um, in chemistry, we're always going to be talking about mass because mass is constant. Um, it doesn't matter if you're on earth, Mars, you know, the sun, mass is mass is mass. And so we're going to be measuring. We always want to know what the amount of stuff is in something. We don't really care what it's, what it's weight is. So even when we measure, um, it's weight, you know, we put it on a scale or something, what we're actually doing is, is, is taking that weight and converting it to mass. Okay. Oh, uh, I have a question. Yeah. If you were to take a scale to the moon and you put something onto that scale, would it read the same mass as it would? Um, oh, no, wow. so I no, because a scale can only measure weight. Now, a scale is calibrated. Oh. And I'll explain what oh, calibration means. A I see later. what that means. It's calibrated to the Earth's gravity. And so, and actually, we've uh, just learned in, in the last few years that the gravity around the, the, the world isn't the same. And that there's, um, there's places that have like different amounts of, of, of gravity than other places. We don't really understand that quite as well. Oh, as we, as so we would do. scientists be freaking out because some things are inconsistent? In some There's places. a special uh, scale? No, but we, we, would, we, would, we would calibrate. Oh, we, I see the, what you mean. So, we would, oh, so when you. we got, so, so I'd, have a, I'd have a, you know, let's say I had a kitchen scale, um, which is way too much for me. So if I had a, a, a bathroom scale, and I put myself on it and I say it weighs you know, 220 pounds or whatever. So that's what my weight is on earth. If I took that same bathroom scale to the moon, I would have to change it because when I got to the moon, if I didn't make any changes to it, it would say, Hey, you only weigh 40 pounds. Cool. But I would have to tweak it. I would have to change its, its calibration so that it would read the same. So my mass is absolutely the same, but my weight would be different. Oh, I see. Thank you for answering yeah. that. Yeah. All right. I'm just going to do uh, one more and we're going to go because we're getting kind of, kind of late here. So another thing to, to, think, to think about, as I've mentioned with the conservation of energy, energy going into a system, energy coming out of that system have to be the same. They have to equal zero. Same thing is true for conservation of matter. It may not seem to make sense. Like, let's go back to the whole previous analogy about um, uh, a fire on, on the beach. I got a, a nice bonfire going. I'm getting lots of heat from it. And everything's cool. Toasting marshmallows, watching the sun go down. You know, all the stuff we used to do <laughs> before all this nonsense. So you look afterwards at the, at the fire when you're done and you just have some ash there. And the mass of that ash is much less than the mass of the logs that you'd use to burn the fire with, right? There's hardly anything. So you would think to yourself, well, you know, the mass after uh, the reaction is less than the amount going in. But you did not consider the mass of the water vapor and the CO2 and all the other gases that were released when you did that, um, when you burned that fire. If you took the mass of all the water and all the CO2 and all the other gases and collected them, you would find that the mass was exactly the same as the logs beforehand. Because you can't create matter. You can't create atoms. They just change from one state to another. So your carbon atoms that were all um, 
you know, connected together in like lignans and the other various things inside the wood, they're still there. They're just CO2 now. So you did not create or destroy any atoms in that reaction. You just changed how they, um, who they're connected to. And so chemical and physical changes, the mass has to be exactly the same because we can't create atoms. Only the sun can do that. Um, in fact, the sun, one, one thing I just sort of uh, learned about in the last few years, I think is really freaky, is that all the elements up to iron are formed in a sun, just like ours. Anything bigger than that had to happen in something much, much bigger, like a supernova or much bigger suns. So I like, I like to think about that way, you know, think about where did all this stuff come from? Come from? came from something much more elaborate than our own sun. So any questions about what we've done so far? Um, so uh, yeah. you, uh, on the screen, it says no detectable change. Uh, right. Would someone not uh, learning chemistry uh, thinking that that would be some undetectable change? Well, we can't, we don't know about undetectable changes because we can't detect them, can we? Okay. <laughs> yeah, that just means that if you do a reaction and you, and you measure all of the masses, they always equal each other. Like it's easy to, to, to do a reaction where gas is released and you can measure the mass of a gas. That's, that's, that's not difficult. You just collect the gas in a tube and you just weigh the tube afterwards. What was the weight of the tube before and what's the weight of the tube after? That's the mass of your gas. So you can, we can measure the masses of gases and liquids and solids. That's, that's not hard to do. And any reaction um, that isn't nuclear, because that's, you're actually, you are changing atoms in that case. You are, but even then, um, if we measure the, the masses of the, of the atoms before and after a nuclear reaction, even then the, the, the mass is conserved. Because in that instance, basically, you're taking protons and neutrons and electrons and breaking them and forming other things. And you can't create or destroy protons, neutrons, and electrons. That's also true for nuclear reactions as well. Yeah. Oh, okay. So this afternoon, uh, for the people in my group, um, hopefully you have the, in Canvas, you'll have the Zoom uh, um, address to go to this afternoon. Um, and then we're going to basically work on doing uh, problems uh, together. You can ask me anything at that point. I'm not going to do all the um, for you. In fact, I'm going to get you to do most of them on, <laughs> on your own. Um, but we're going to be working, uh, working together. Um, and then next week, we will start our first lab and we'll talk more about labs and how to do lab reports and all that kind of stuff then. This PowerPoint would be on uh, Canvas, right? It is on Canvas right now. In fact, they are, they're all on Canvas. Okay. Yeah. All of uh, them. Is the link for the lab going to be the same as the recitation or is it no, going to be different, different than all the other? Okay. It's different. Thank you. Yeah, there's, there's one link for lectures, one for recitations and one for labs. I think they're, all, they're all different.